Um, welcome to everyone. I'm very happy to, on behalf of the Community Senior Center, to um, welcome Margaret Woodruff. She's the director of the Charlotte Library. And she has um, <coughs> brought to us her knowledge about libraries, um, their contribution to advancing civilization, really, and and some of the ways that um, some of the places and buildings that have housed libraries. Um, and I'm sure she'll have a lot of interesting things to say, and I'm very anxious to hear. And you have a lot of library lovers here, so. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> Take it away, Margaret. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Thank you uh, for letting me join you today. Um, as Peggy mentioned, I'm the director of the Charlotte Library, and um, I've been the director here since 2011 and worked at the library since 2003, but I've been a library fan my entire life from, you know, the first days I went to the children's section with my grandmother. Um, and, but today I'm gonna share with you some of the history and technology and the sense of community to, that to me make up amazing libraries. So it's a very personal perspective. And um, when I'm done, I'd, I'd love to hear what you all have to say. I feel like so many things, it is a very um, individual uh, viewpoint. So with that being said, I will get started. So amazing libraries. I'm gonna be talking about what it makes an amazing library to me. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, libraries are everywhere from big to small. The Library of Congress, one of the largest library complexes in the world to the very small. You all may be familiar with the uh, Little Free Libraries. And as I said, we have one here at the Grange Hall in Charlotte, um, which is a place for people to be able to bring their books and take away books that are new to them. Uh, but what does amazing mean? How do you define that in terms of a library? I think there is so much information out there, uh, a library of libraries, if you will, that you, you know, where do you begin? So I just narrowed it down a little bit. And today I'll be talking about the architecture and history, the technology, and uh, the sense of community that a library creates. So uh, the Library of Alexandria, Ancient Egypt is one of the most well-known libraries, certainly well-known for the lore about its uh, destruction. But uh, prior to that, it was, you know, one of the uh, foundation spots of learning in the ancient world, had, you know, over 40,000 scrolls and uh, hundreds of scholars uh, attached to that institution. Um, and in fact, it did not uh, have a cataclysmic end. It sort of fell on hard times and uh, suffered some uh, uh, setbacks when various armies, including Julius Caesar at one point, uh, showed up. But um, it is, I think, when we think about the start of libraries, that is one of the libraries we all think of. And I think, again, it's the key uh, role of a library, which is to share. But there were many other libraries in the ancient world that uh, had this same role. Uh, the Ebla Library in uh, Aleppo, Syria, was um, discovered in the 1950s, and it was in excavation over the next 10 years by a team of French archaeologists that they discovered a uh, Royal Library with over um, uh, 1,800 complete clay tablets with cuneiform on them, and they were arranged in um, uh, in categories, cataloged the way we might, uh, you know, divide up a collection in a library today, and uh, is considered to be, you know, sort of one of the first kinds of of collections. Uh, in uh, in existence. 
Uh, then the Palatine Library in Rome. This is considered to be the first uh, public library in that it wasn't um, a private collection. Um, and it included both Greek and Latin texts and um, was open to everybody who was considered a citizen of Rome. So that I think was, um, you know, uh, raises the question of access, but uh, certainly um, open and available. Uh, but it wasn't just in, uh, you know, Europe and the Mediterranean area where uh, the library related activities were happening. This is an image from the Pulgaksa Temple, excuse my pronunciation, um, in Korea. And this is a library of wood blocks that they used to uh, create um, documents, uh, mostly sutras and other religious texts. And on the right-hand side of this image, you can see a picture. This is one of the um, oldest surviving wood block prints and it dates from about uh, 750 um, the common era. Um, so, you know, might be a little bit different from what we think of as a library, but I think certainly the color, again, the collection of information and the ability to make that information accessible. Um, another library in Asia that's quite famous is the Tiangi Pavilion in um, China. And uh, this was a uh, library, it was not a public library, but it, it marked, it came together at a time when there were some big changes in um, technology. And I think that's another link I'll talk about in a little bit uh, between libraries and um, the world around them. The increased use of paper meant that uh, it was easier for more people to have access to materials. And also um, the rise of the scholar class in China uh, meant that uh, that access became increasingly important. Uh, and then we have the Middle Ages, uh, the Middle East rather. Uh, this is thought to be an image from the uh, House of Wisdom or otherwise known as the Grand Library of Baghdad that um, was uh, around the uh, beginning of the Common Era. It was uh, destroyed in 1258, but uh, you can see in the background those stacks of uh, um, books and other uh, pieces of information, as well as the group of scholars sharing a book in the foreground. Um, and uh, this uh, Grand Library of Baghdad was considered a place um, where information was gathered from all over. There was a great movement to translate a lot of information during this third caliphate when this um, building and this institution thrived. And these scholars were drawing on information from all over the world and translating it so that it was available to uh, the people in, uh, in their country. Uh, then we have uh, the Middle Ages. Some of you, if you've traveled in Italy, you might uh, recognize this. Uh, this is the Mala Testiana, again, forgive my pronunciation, uh, library in Italy. And um, it opened in 1454 and it was the first civic library in Europe. So it was not, again, not connected to a religious uh, house or a private family, um, but open for people to come in and get information. Um, but again, because of that um, and because of the value of books at that time, you can see that they were all chained to the reading desks where people would look at the, uh, would look at the information. Um, and then another interesting point for me was how information traveled. And because these books were so valuable, you know, they were when they did have to move from place to place, they were placed in coffers and locked up. It was something that was not as freely available, you know, as we think of books and that kind of material today. Uh, in the 17th century, the rise of university libraries. This is an image of the Bodleian Library at the um, Oxford University, which was founded in 1602 and it was 
drawn largely from a private collection um, of uh, um, and put together for scholars to use who were students at the university. In the 18th century, there were sort of two strands of uh, libraries in existence. On the left-hand side, you see a pen and ink drawing of a gentleman's library, such as one might find at a, you know, an English country home. Perhaps we've all seen similar images um, watching a PBS TV or something. Uh, and then on the right, uh, the cornerstone of the Library Company of Philadelphia, which you all might be familiar with, founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1731 with a group of fellow readers who felt that if they could pool their resources, it would um, create a larger collection of reading materials for all of them. So it wasn't a public library in the sense that it was free. You did have to pay a fee to join, but it was sort of a, a stepping stone toward that in this country and a model that was imitated up and down the Atlantic coast um, uh, throughout the 18th century. In 19th century, we saw the dawn of public libraries. Um, I think we're all familiar with uh, Andrew Carnegie, but Henry Tate was another benefactor of libraries and uh, over 2000 libraries were um, established in the United States, thanks to them. And, uh, but the first public library was founded in a uh, tax supported library, uh, was founded in 1833 in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And then we have the 20th century. Uh, you all might be familiar with the image on the right, which is the Fletcher Free Library in Burlington. Um, and uh, the 20th century saw a huge proliferation of libraries and a huge variety of the types of uh, public libraries that were being built. We had the very classical uh, Carnegie style, such as the Fletcher Free, which is a Carnegie library, um, which was a style that was imitated. This is this image on the left is a library in Japan, but modeled a lot like the classic uh, Carnegie style libraries that when I think of the iconic public library, that is what I think of. But then in the background, you can see an image of the library at Yale University, uh, which is a very modern structure. And I think um, as libraries continue to become important institutions, in the public forum, as well as uh, for academics, um, different kinds of needs and different kinds of styles developed. And certainly in the 21st century, uh, libraries are going strong. The um, image on the lower left is the, I always have to look this up. It's the library uh, in the Binhai Cultural District in Tianjin, China. And uh, this can hold up to 1.2 million books. And I think you can see all the uh, shelves right by where this person is standing. Um, so I think part of what's it so interesting about this to me is the fact that uh, people had been um, uh, predicting the demise of the book for so long. And yet I think the uh, the fact that we all enjoy holding on to books and the fact that they are such a reliable way of holding on to information. Again, for me, one of the um, benchmarks of librarianship um, that you would build a building, you know, in the 21st century that can hold 1.2 million volumes. That really says something. But at the same time, libraries are also taking on a lot of different roles. And uh, one of the uh, movements within the librarianship is uh, to help create a more uh, give and take perspective so that people who come to the library aren't only coming to get information, but they are coming to share their information. So uh, they might be coming to create a recording or uh, put on a presentation about water quality in your community. Um, so it's the library as a place where those things can happen and not just uh, solely a one-way uh, provider of information is, um, is a new thing. And this um, picture on the right is the Tionville Library in France. And uh, 
again, 21st Century Library, and it has so many different kinds of spaces where people can meet, create, learn, teach, socialize. Uh, so it's sort of considered um, the standard by which a lot of uh, large libraries are trying to uh, meet. Of course, in this day and age, sustainability remains a critical issue. And this is a model of the Tabo Mbeki Presidential Library in South Africa. And when completed, it will be built out of stone created from local mud and all the floors will be um, crafted out of local wood. So it's, um, I think, a testament to libraries' commitment to sustainability. Some people say that uh, libraries idea of sustainability goes back to the fact that we exchange materials and you know what could be more sustainable than um, having community held collection of books which are shared among people rather than each person having to go out and, and buy those materials for themselves. So, uh, but libraries aren't all about buildings. They're also about the technology and what, what is inside of them. And um, I found some fascinating things to me. Going back to Ebla, the library uh, cache that was discovered in Syria, these are the cuneiform tablets. And uh, again, they were categorized by the type of information they provided. Um, one of the things they discovered was that the community of Ebla was a place, a great uh, beer brewing um, center, and that they had well-documented records of the, the beer that was uh, brewed there and sent throughout the local area. Uh, papyrus, I think we are all familiar with this as well, um, used by the Egyptians from the um, you know, 2900 uh, BCE up through the 8th century about in the Arab world. It was uh, the, the preferred um, uh, resource to use, but uh, a lot of other places found it difficult and it was very expensive. So the people who did use it ended up having to be very thrifty. I read somewhere that the uh, one ancient Egyptian um, they were preparing, when they were preparing mummies for burial, they would use old pieces of papyrus to finish stuffing out the um, mummy uh, containers. And when they did, when, they, when this was excavated, they discovered some actually very valuable Egyptian texts in and among the um, papyrus that had been stuffed around this mummy. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight too, as far as technology was the, that this wasn't all European based or Asian based, but that there was some interesting collections of information in, in the area that we live in right here. This is a, an image of a kipu, which is a string um, inventory, if you will. And the uh, ancient Indian civilization used this method to keep track of military campaigns, censuses, harvest records. And so again, uh, looking at a way of keeping track of information, I would say that this absolutely qualifies as something that would belong in a library. Similarly, we have these codices from the Mayan and Aztec civilizations. There are so few uh, codices left for the Mayan world, um, so many d destroyed by the Spanish when they arrived, but um, they do highlight some of the religious and um, mythic origins of the Mayans, um, And uh, but such a small slice that uh, I read somewhere, somebody said it would be like basing the entire um, perspective of uh, European history on the book Pilgrim's Progress. So it's just, they know there's so much more and this is just such a small slice. Um, one particular uh, item of note is that the paper that was used by the Mayans, they created this very durable paper and in fact was more durable than the papyrus that was being used at a similar time in Egypt. 
On the right-hand side, you can see the uh, uh, example of the Aztec codices, and these had a better survival rate, and in fact were used uh, as a source of information when the Spanish arrived in um, in the Aztec area uh, as a way for them to, to gather information. Uh, moving back to uh, the European world, um, Parchment was also used. It was easier to put together into a book, which became the preferred method, um, especially among monasteries of um, containing information. So parchment, which is made from animal skin and um, put together, uh, could be used as a scroll or, or put together in a, in a codex or a book as you, as you see here. And, uh, in China, the use of bamboo strips before the invention of paper, they used uh, bamboo strips to document things. And I think from what I've read, this uh, explains the uh, direction in which Chinese characters were written rather than across a page from right to left, they were written down so that they could each fit, the characters fit vertically on the, uh, on the bamboo strips. And then the invention of paper, and uh, which revolutionized everything, made everything so much more uh, accessible and available, um, and was used across the world. So, um, from this, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> example of a paper scroll in Japan to uh, a codex um, or a book in China. And now, of course, we have a digital. Uh, libraries so you can access ebooks and audiobooks, newspapers, encyclopedias uh, in a way that we never would have imagined, uh, you know, even uh, 20 years ago, I think. So, section three, and uh, perhaps the one that's um, dearest to my heart, is what makes libraries amazing is the sense of community. Um, and that is based on access, and access through the ages hasn't always been uh, equal. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the TV show Arthur, but uh, my daughters, this was one of their favorite um, uh, episodes when Arthur goes to get his library card, because having fun isn't hard when you've got a library card, but you have to make sure that you can get a library card, uh, and as I mentioned previously, uh, you know, whether it was the um, ancient library in Alexandria or a monastery in France, um, there was very limited access to the information that was contained there. Uh, then you move forward several centuries, uh, but you still had to pay money to, to, to gain access. So the Boston Athenaeum you have paid your yearly subscription um, to become part of it. And then we moved to the public library and uh, that opened the doors to everybody, including children, which was a huge change and really uh, sort of paralleled the drive for uh, literacy, um, especially um, in this country and, and in Canada. Um, and then there's remote access. As I mentioned, there's digital access on the right, you know, how we can easily sit in our living rooms. I'm making this presentation to you today because we have this remote access. But for some, remote access also meant that the books were brought to them. And here is a picture uh, from Columbia. This was a Biblio Burroughs was a program started by a Colombian history teacher who discovered that the, some of his students didn't have access to the materials that they needed. And he got his two Burroughs and saddled them up and started delivering books. And um, I think uh, maybe some of you are familiar with the book, uh, The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek, which is about a, it's a novelization of a similar program that was, uh, took place here in the 1930s in uh, Appalachia when women would ride around on horses uh, delivering books to people. Um, another thing that uh, helps create the sense of community in libraries is safeguarding information. Um, 
the librarian of Basra was a woman who uh, directed the library in this city, and she protected over 30,000 volumes during the um, invasion of Iraq and enabled many texts to be safeguarded, including some, you know, irreplaceable uh, Muslim holy texts that uh, would have been lost to the world had she not um, done that. Similarly, I don't know if you all are familiar with this book, The Badass Librarians of Timbuktu, but this features the story of a young scholar who together with a group of like-minded um, intellectuals packed up uh, many ancient texts in the country of Mali um, and shipped them in these metal bins uh, packed on the backs of donkeys uh, out of the country uh, before the Al-Qaeda um, Islamic militants came in and, and uh, who had pledged to destroy all of this information that had lasted for centuries uh, and would have been a real loss to the uh, history of that land and of, of Muslim culture as well. Um, and then connections, you know, Ray Bradbury says, without libraries, what have we? We have no past and we have no future. And I think libraries are a place where that can happen. This is a photo from our collection here in Charlotte of the library hall. This was the um, first social, uh, the original Charlotte social library, again, a fee paying library. So it wasn't public, but in the sense that you had to pay money to be a member, but it did let in people and they, uh, shared books and other information. Um, and then what's amazing today about our libraries, this is a photo of our new children's room and I think it represents the openness and welcoming and innovation that uh, that we strive for here and in libraries everywhere. Uh, and uh, some of that is that we have to share a space and might be with people we don't Believe, uh, agree with, and it might be ideas that are not comfortable to us, but it's a place where you can um, encounter those uh, without feeling threatened your th yourself, excuse me. Uh, and we strive to promote lifelong learning. This is a photo of just some of the kits that we offer here at the Charlotte Library, everything from Legos, to Zentangle drawing, we have origami kits, we have um, macrame and embroidery. Uh, you can learn how to bird watch with one of our kits. So just a wide range of um, resources for that. And getting back to the sort of uh, um, give and take that we are striving to promote. Some of these kits are, have been created and developed by people in, in the community. So we're drawing on their expertise to, to make sure that we have good information to provide others. Uh, kind of similar, and you might've heard of this as well, the Library of Things, which is uh, a collection of items um, that people can borrow so they might not need to have them at home uh, or they wanna try them out before they make the investment themselves. This is a picture of a library of things in, in Britain and a wider range of things than we offer here in Charlotte. You could borrow a barbecue grill or a lawnmower. We have a more modest library of things, but you can borrow a telescope or an apple picker or a hot glue gun. Um, and libraries, all about maintaining access. Um, for some, that means making the uh, online offerings you have accessible by having uh, visual and auditory um, supports for people who might need that kind of assistance. Um, and in, in another way, maintaining access is making sure that resources continue to be available to people. This picture on the left is uh, was taken during our shutdown for COVID and uh, perhaps you encountered some more things at your libraries, but uh, where we pack up books and um, put them out for people to pick up. So it was contactless um, use of uh, library resources um, in that way. Um, and expanding literacy, uh, that's sort of one of the other uh, 
goals of our library and libraries everywhere. Um, on the left, we have a photo of our pickup point for the Charlotte Seed Library. So we have a collection of seeds here that is curated by some volunteers, again, bringing their wisdom and knowledge to the library. Um, and people can request those seeds, plant them out. If they're fortunate enough to have some to save, they can give those back and the process continues. On the right, we have our Charlie cart, which is a portable kitchen. And that's another um, food literacy is another um, topic that we are uh, continuing to expand on and explore here at the Charlotte Library. So that's a few things about what we're what we find amazing, what I find amazing about libraries. And I would be curious to know what makes a library amazing to you. Thank you very much. Well, Margaret, I'm, I'm curious, you run a lot of um, book discussion groups and book mm -hmm. groups, but just also just discussion groups. Right? And I wonder where you feel that fits into the success of a library or, or where that fits in in general. Hmm. Well, I think uh, for me in a selfish way, I love to talk about books. So it's great, always great to have that opportunity. Um, I think it's a way to share uh, and for people to try out books that they might not otherwise, for whatever reason, they might not know about it or they're like, ooh, science fiction, I'm not so sure. But if it's presented as part of your book group, maybe you'll jump in and, and give it a try. So I think it's a way to expand people's um, interest and certainly mine. You know, sometimes people will suggest something and I'll be like, oh, all right, we'll give it a go. Nice. Uh, Margaret, um, our library in Richmond has made it possible for a lot of our senior programs to exist because we don't mm -hmm. have a center. Yep. So they have given us a space mm -hmm. to use. And um, I think that's an important part of our library. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And we are fortunate enough to have a senior center here in Charlotte, but uh, one of the great things um, is the spirit of collaboration. And so we co-sponsor a lot of programs. Uh, for instance, we just had one, um, it sort of jumped off of, we have a collection of reading aids here. So if people have trouble accessing text for whatever reason, magnifiers and book bones and all that kind of thing that were supplied by the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, so we um, partnered together with the Charlotte Senior Center and had their representative come down and do a presentation that we both both sponsored. So I think uh, you're bringing that up is something I missed, but I think collaboration is certainly an important part of, uh, of creating a, a strong library community. Um, I, ha I just had a comment uh, yeah. this summer uh, we've been just traveling around the state and mm -hmm. just stopping in some of the libraries that just to see the architecture. Mm -hmm. And um, and my other comment is just the uh, if if anyone here hasn't been to the Derby Line Library, that's just fun to go to. And they're 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 attached to an opera house. Yeah, um, but you know you can put one foot in Canada and one foot in. Uh, the U.S. and have your picture taken right on the line. That's right. That's right. And that they have actually, uh, that has, I think during COVID, there was some, um, that was an interesting time to navigate for all of us, but for that library director and that library in particular, because uh, of the, you know, Canada and the U.S., the border was closed. So how do you, how do you library in that way? They, uh, some creative thinking took place. Peggy? I, I was really fascinated about Peterborough, New Hampshire, and I thought, I wonder if New England 
the libraries in New England. I mean, the fact that Vermont has so many of these little libraries and little towns, it's just so amazing to me. Yeah. And I wonder if that is a New England thing. That's a or good question. I think uh, yes and no. I think that certainly the the way that New England developed with so many small towns and villages and um, and the um, emphasis on learning that was so important to the uh, Europeans who came here um, probably created that. Vermont is unique in that uh, we have no state funding for libraries. So uh, as you know, probably you've seen the light item on the, for the budget, the library budget at, at your town meeting. Um, and uh, that means that each community gets to develop its own library, unlike say Massachusetts, which does have a state library system. Um, and so there's a little, there's good things and bad things about each, each way. Does anybody have a, a favorite library story or a memory they have of their first visit to a library or anything? I'm always interested in hearing how people first encountered libraries. Well, one of mine is I grew up um, near Stanford in California and was the bookmobile. I mean, honestly, it was just, oh, I mean, we had libraries, but when that bookmobile came around, it was just so exciting and so physical um, coming into a neighborhood or a mm -hmm. spot and, and also such a confined space and such a curated space for kids. Um, I just... I, I wish there were still bookmobiles. One more thing to add to the Charlotte Library's list of things to things to do, build a bookmobile. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I think there are, I know the Williston Library has a bookmobile. Do they? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it is a matter of uh, having the capital to set that up. Right, um, right. But I think Vermont, actually Vermont, you know, Vermont communities would be great candidates for that. They probably would, right? Yeah, yeah. They're quite we are quite spread out. Or I guess some of us could get on horses and do what they did. You know. <laughs> that would not be me, but someone I, could. I like that idea even better. In the 50s, I, I grew up in Wilder near White River, and we had our own library in Wilder. And mm -hmm. um, the, the state had a bookmobile that would come to that library and bring new titles. We always look forward to that because... Yeah they would bring things that our library didn't buy. Our library was about as big as my living room. Right. right. And, then, and the, those books would be there for a while, and then they'd go mm -hmm. back to the bookmobile. Mm -hmm. I remember that being an exciting thing. Yeah, actually, we do that now with, um, we don't have space to maintain a, a whole large print collection, but we do have a lot of people that find those to be very useful um, options for reading. And uh, so the state does a similar kind of thing they don't have a mobile, but they uh, they send them through the mail. So we get a collection of large print books. We keep them for 90 days. People can enjoy them. We send them off and they send us a new batch. So oh. it is a nice way. It is a nice way to share resources for sure. Well, and I just want to comment, Margaret, that I think what you do with the Charlotte Library is nothing short of magnificent. Oh. <laughs> The way you make it a community and um, make it a part of the community and just what you do personally and what your staff does and how embraced it is and and yeah, it's just fantastic. So well, thanks. I think it's one of the great things about working at a library and I would say I that is those are um, features of libraries everywhere. Uh, you know, I'm a little bit familiar with the Richmond Library, and I know what a wonderful space that is, and um, how you know how responsive their their staff is as well. So, I feel lucky that I get to work in such a great space. <laughs> And I hope you'll all come visit me in Charlotte and see the Charlotte Library for yourself. 